affects us. Basically, I'll just say a quick nutshell. I gave him an object and a message that had to do with God's ancient jubilee. And the jubilee is that 50th year when God reverses everything, undoes everything. For, for It could be a blessing or it could be a judgment. And so the object I gave him was linked to that. His reign would come to an end in his 50th year, not just the 50th year of his rising, but the 50th day of the 50th year at the exact hour, all, all to the Jubilee. That is, that is beyond from Leviticus. It actually determined the rise and fall of Fidel Castro. And this mystery has to do with America. And now. Jonathan discovered this same supernatural phenomenon was behind the pandemic. Rabbi, what yeah. did you uncover? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Bible says that if you, you, you harm children, it's going to come back to you. And, and the year of the Jubilee, remember, you know, if you took somebody's land, you're, you, it gets taken from you. That's the other side of it. So That's the judgment yeah, side. Yeah, that's the judgment side of it. So America actually began abortion on demand in the year 1970. And so what happens if you go to the Jubilee? What year is that? That's 2020 the year of the plague. 2020 and 50 is 70. 70, yeah, and the thing is that, so that's exactly, so we took life and then a plague comes upon us and it takes life. But it goes deeper, Sid, because the exact day abortion came to the continent through New York. And the, and it, the day that that bill was introduced that would change America was January 20th, 1970. Go 50 years forward, January 20th, 2020, is the, the day that the plague entered America. Patient zero, 50 years to the exact date. And here's another one, if you remember in March. Excuse yeah. me, I want to make yeah. this clear. Child sacrifice yes. was going on in Israel. They sacrificed to false gods. What do you think is going on with most of the abortions in America? It's child sacrifice to the the God of pleasure. And, and God says it comes back. That's a, that, that's a law. And so remember, remember when COVID basically shut down America. It was the middle of March. President went on the, on the air. Uh, we were quarantined. Everything went into lockdown. The song, it was called the day that changed everything. It was March 11th, March 11th, 2020. Now, the thing is, if you go back 50 years, you find, did anything happen? March 11th, 1970, was the exact day that abortion on demand began on American soil. It was 50 years to the day again when the plague fell on America. Here's another thing. Where, what, what is the capital of abortion in America? New York. Where did the plague center when it came on? It centered on New York. And there was one milestone day in the plague when New York surpassed every other nation in the world for the plague. And the date was, the milestone was April 10th. April 10th, was 50 years to the day when New York legalized abortion. I mean, you cannot make this up. You cannot, you cannot, only the hand of God here. Not only that, it's that where did, where did abortion spread in America? It was through New York. In the first three years, up until Roe versus Wade, most abortions were done in New York. Well, you know what? They just discovered this, Sid. The plague spread more than any other place was from New York. The, the virus had the markers, the DNA markers that go to New York. But there was one other gate. That's the Eastern Gate. The Western Gate, abortion also came into America that year, 1970, through Washington State. You know, the, you know where the play came? The other one was Washington State. Same gate, patient zero. So whoever got COVID, you had the markers of the two gates where abortion came to America. I mean, it, it's, it's exactly minute. You said that before. It's minute and it's exact. The hand of God. Uh, you know, if that was all there was, it had to be beyond coincidence. But Jonathan has found the whole Bible is filled with these patterns, which proves, although it was written by different people in different generations, in different countries, one mind was behind these good Jewish secretaries that took perfect dictation from Hashem, from God. Could an ancient calendar lie behind recent catastrophic events? I'm down to the exact second. Next. Right back to It's Supernatural. 
The Josiah Manifesto is, I believe, the most important thing I could share. It's a mystery that is so big, it encompasses everything, even mysteries that I've written about in the past that are now coming home altogether, they're all converging. This is the reality of God, the mystery, the stunning mysteries behind our world, what's happened in recent times that have changed our lives, the hand of the God of the Bible. It'll all be revealed in the Josiah Manifesto. Now return to It's Supernatural. Rabbi Jonathan discovered a connection between recent catastrophic events, the biblical feasts, and an ordinance given to ancient Israel by God on Mount Sinai. Explain, Jonathan. Yeah, the year of those shakings, and I will say one thing, you know, in that three-year period when abortion first came to America, up till Roe versus Wade, it was three years, 1.3 million children were killed. Mm. In the three years of the plague that happened, COVID, 50 years later, how many Americans? 1.3 million, the exact, exact same. And, and you remember, Sid, that year of shaking, you know, behind every shaking of that year was an actual ancient Hebrew holy day from God's appointed calendar. I won't go into what's in the, in the book right now, but to say this, behind the plague, behind, there is a ancient Hebrew holy day that was behind the plague. Behind, remember the, the riots and the Is fire? that why God says to yep. observe these holy days forever? It's not legalism for a believer. It's that you have to. It's, there's revelation. There's a portal to heaven, literally, on these holy days. Yeah, yeah. Listen, he's the God of everything. So when he when he comes up with something, it's gonna be it's gonna tell you something. So actually, so the first one was linked to the plague. This first Hebrew holy day in the spring. Second shaking was when the the riots and the fires and the rages. Behind that was also was the second Hebrew holy day. Actually, it determined the exact day when it started. I, I'm holding back on some of it because we're gonna do more. But the other thing was, and then you know, one of the other days, and everything in order is the Feast of Trumpets. You know, Feast of Trumpets is when you turn to God. You're supposed to turn back, repentance and all that. Well, do you know on that, that was the day that the Supreme Court was altered and a Supreme Court justice passed from the earth, which opened the door for the overturning of abortion on the day of trumpets. That's when it happened. And by the way, she happened to be Jewish. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it happened. Listen, Sid, the mystery, mysteries, some of the mysteries in the Josiah Manifesto, even what happened on January 6th on Capitol Hill and Trump is actually the templates in the Bible. Actually, and I wrote of it, I spoke of it with you years ago. So, I mean, it, it's everything, Sid. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. Rabbi Jonathan actually witnessed firsthand a supernatural convergence that is connected to the changing of American history. Rabbi, describe what we saw. This was the, in the midst of that year, I was led with a, a, a great man of God to come together and call for a day of prayer, National Day of Prayer and Repentance, and on the National Mall, and at Sacred Assembly. And we met there, and we prayed, called the return. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing that, we're praying about, okay. The, the thing is, we had no idea, Sid, that I had no idea, until we were just about there, that there's actually a day on the Hebrew calendar that's called Shabbat Shuvah, which means the day of the return. <laughs> you know, and so the day of the return, God had it on the day of the return, which is about a nation praying. It says, you know, Joel, pray for revival. You'll pray for repentance. We pray for the ending of this sin. Well, on that same day, Sid, you know, that, that is the, it actually could be translated as the day of turning, to turn a nation. And that same day, Trump, that was the day he chose to nominate the last Supreme Court justice who would, that vote would overturn abortion. That day, he nominated Amy Barrett. And the thing is, there's a mystery with that linked to the child of the Nile, which is in the book, but that was the day that set in motion the overturning of abortion, that, that nomination, that third vote. So on the same day, we're praying for return. The day that God appointed for the turning, now, of the nation, it actually started turning. But the thing was, I was led at the end, the end part, to say we're all gonna join together, seal it all with a the sound of God's power, the sound of the shofar. I, I actually was watching that really? on television, and I was surprised at the number of people you had there that knew how to blow the shofar. <laughs> yeah, well, it's good that they did. And then I said, I said, when you hear the shout, and all there was thousands, tens of thousands of people say, shout, like Jericho. So I said, we're sealing it. Let the power of, go for, of God go forth. I said, go. Okay, the moment was 5 o'clock, 4 minutes, and 33 seconds. At that same instant, on the White House lawn, 
President Trump opens his mouth and the beginning of the overturning of abortion begins five o'clock, four minutes and 33 seconds to the exact same second. The history of America pivoted on God's day called the day of turning to the hour, to the minute, to the exact second. That's how precise God is. God, you want to know that the God of the Bible is real? Uh, literally, our history has been altered by him, by his hand, with his fingerprints. And the word turning really is what someone should do when they're involved in sin. It means repentance. That was the day. Yeah, and, and that's when God says, I'll bring, I'll bring blessing, I'll bring revival, I'll bring that. And so that was the first thing. So God showed his hand. And, and I'll show another thing. You know, you know, Sid, you know, what's the name of our president? I mean, the president who was, it's Trump. What does Trump mean in English? It means trumpet. So here, listen, this is the jubilee of abortion, okay? We're sounding the trumpets. I said, go, that the trumpets sound, the trumpets sound, and then on the White House, the Trump sounds. And on the day, the, and what happens? It overturns. When the Trump sounds in the year of jubilee, it brings a turning to restoration, and that's where it all began. The God of Israel, the God of the Bible, is alive and well, and he has changed, he has actually altered our lives. I'll I, I tell you, if that was all there was, it would have been enough. But it's revelation after revelation. And actually, you told me, once someone uncovers these revelations that, that you talk about in the book from the Bible that are irrefutable, uh, and you'll see when you read it for yourself, they then are all put together, explain that. Yeah, it's all gonna converge. Like, like, just like all these mysteries start converging on this one moment, it's actually gonna converge. I've never had a book like this. It's gonna converge that, that presents a key that's gonna open up the ultimate mystery, which is, which is actually the guide to the end times. And I believe this is from God, that, that is for now, and it's for what, what is yet ahead. How are we gonna live? How do we survive? How do we prevail? All the purpose, God, just as real as this was with God, I believe just as real, God has given us a key and an answer, which comes from the Bible, of course, but it's actually gonna give us the key. That's why, that's why it's called the Josiah Manifesto, because much, they have a whole part, which is how do you live now? Is God actually, well, the, the, the thing is, Sid, when I remember when I heard the news that, uh, that Roe vs. Wade was overturned. And I was in the airport, and I looked at my cell phone, and a scripture popped up that I did not ask for. It just popped up. And it was, it was from Psalm 106, and it talks about when Israel turned away from God, they offered up their children. It talks about a plague that came on them until one man named Phineas took an action, righteous action, and the plague subsided. Well, I wonder, well, now, if the Supreme Court did that, could there be a, something like that? Be, and the thing is this. When the Supreme Court actually voted on this and actually started writing the decision that would overturn it, it wasn't in June. It was actually at the end of 2021 when they voted. And, and in January, Judge Alito is working on the decision that's going to overturn abortion. And he released it to the court in the beginning of February. Well, here's the thing, Sid. At that same time, the, the, the plague was actually at its peak. It was actually, at that time, it was three times higher than it had ever been and of infections. And then when he when he worked on this thing, when he started when when the thing was finished, you know what happened, Sid? The rate of the plague plunged that within a few weeks it was one eighth and it never came back. It was actually the week that the judge, that the Supreme Court began rolling back abortion, the sin, and the plague subsided. And you know what? You know, people don't know this. It actually you know what his name? Samuel Alito. Samuel means in the Bible. You know, people have been praying for years, pr yeah, praying for years, praying for years, and this, it means God has heard. God has heard. And, and here's another thing with this, is actually the, the uh, jubilee of Roe versus Wade began on January 22nd, the 50th year, uh, 2022, and it went till January 22nd, 2023. On the exact day that it began, the CDC records that the death rate of the plague reached its highest and then all of a sudden plunged again and it was gone. It happened at the, ex the, at the exact day of the jubilee of Roe versus Wade. Now, now, the thing is, now the thing is here, is, this is something so crucial because what does this have to do with the broken altar? The, and if you look at the, at the book, the cover, you're gonna see the broken altar. The broken altar, there was no altar in America that was so brazen as that of abortion. We killed 60 million children. And so, and so what happened on that day is God began to crack it open, crack it open. And what is that a sign of? In the Bible, that's a sign of revival.
You see, you see, in ancient times, when there was revival, it wasn't a tent meeting. It, they broke the altars of the gods. And I, I got to tell you something, if it's okay, it's kind of a secret, but, every little bit, but, but when I was last here and I finished the Return of the Gods, okay, I mean, I was, when I was working on the Return of the Gods, one of my associates came to me and said, I, I was woken up in the middle of the night and I had a vision and a word, and Jonathan, I got to tell you what it is. And he never did this before. He said, I see you bringing forth a word uh, to these altars of the gods, and then, and, and then all of a sudden when you did, the altar cracked open and, this, and the spirits went out and revived. There was, there was a spirit come upon. Now, so the thing is, the day that I finished the return of the gods, that was the day that the Supreme Court overturned abortion. That day, the altar was cracked open. God's saying, this is a broken altar. Now, this is so crucial. This is, I, I want everybody to hear this. This, I believe, is all coming together. This is the moment we're in. The broken altar is either it's about a nation that has fallen from God. It can head to judgment or it can head to revival. And there could be revival or there can be both. That's where we are right now. Is this God is giving us a chance. And this is ultimately about revival. And that's what we have to pray. That's why. The, and, and the other thing is, which biblical character is linked to a broken altar? Well, it's, the, it's Josiah. Josiah was born when a nation was heading to judgment. But that one person with the spirit of God actually turned the nation back. He turned the nation back to God, the revival. And that's what opens the door to the revelation of the Josiah Manifesto, that in this one man and what God did at that moment is actually the key for us, what we need to do for now, the end times, and for such a time as this, to prevail and overcome. That begs the question. Now, what does all of this have to do with Josiah, yeah. the last days, yeah. and the blueprint for yeah. the end times? Yeah, Josiah was actually lived in the last days of Israel. There was actually judgment coming. And one of the things is that we are living in the last days and we are also living at a time when we're watching apostasy and it's crazy and all that. You know, last time I was with you, Sid, you know, when you were opening up the, the return of the gods, it's like, what's the answer? The Lord let me say, you got to give them the, the answer. The answer is here. And so there, we actually can prevail. You know, if the, I, if we said this before, but one of the things about Josiah is these were dark times, but he, he was radical for God. You have, we, God is calling us to be radical. The, the last 100 pages of the book are the keys and the secrets and and, the, and what we need to know, the guide for this hour and this day. What do we need to know? And, and one of the things, you know, one of the one of the, the sections is called is called uh, against the flow. Another one is called separation and resistance. Another one's called the powers because it's about the powers, secrets of the powers God's given us. Another one is called the agents of heaven on earth. God has called us not to be on the defensive now. This is our hour. This, this is this is this is a biblical hour. Many people in your audience have been praying. I wish I lived in Bible times. Congratulations, you're in Bible times now. This is what it's about. And all and so we have the the key and the secret to live radically for God. And so this is what God. Then I said, God, give me the answer. Give give me for the people because they need. And that's what this all is leading to. The same God who did all these things is saying there is an answer, there is a way, and there is a way to overcome. And this could be the greatest hour. You know, we talk about glory and talk about revival. You know, this can be that there's darkness, but there's also light. People think the end times is just darkness. It's not just darkness. It's darkness, but the darkness brings out the lights of God. And so those who stand for God are going to be the brightest they have ever been if they stand for God. But this is an hour to be radical. And that's Josiah was radical for God. And Josiah, Josiah broke the altars of man. And Josiah was led by the spirit of God. And God has this plan for us for this hour, for such a time as this. And you know what's interesting? It's not one or two men or women. It is whosoever is hungry for God. I believe God is giving mercy to our nation. There are too many young people and even older people that don't know God. This is your moment to know God. Now, I need to address the Pope. What just happened is ramifications for the future, even for the end times. I don't have a choice. This is to all of you who watch my messages and to you who are Catholic and those who are not Catholic, send it to your Catholic friends and for that matter, to your non-Catholic friends. This is Jonathan Kahn. First, a note. As more and more people watch this channel, there are all sorts of fake Jonathan Khan sites springing up like mushrooms. If it doesn't say official with a check mark in the title, it's a fake. As this past year drew to a close, something seismic happened. 
the repercussions of which are going to be felt for years. For many of you, this is your wake-up call. The Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, the one whom Catholic doctrine says is the Vicar of Christ, Messiah's representative on earth, decreed that the Catholic Church is now to give its blessings to same-sex unions. After nearly 2,000 years of designating such things as grievous sin, which has been the stand of Christianity for 2,000 years, the Pope has decided that the Catholic Church is now going to bless these unions. Now, the official Catholic doctrine on such matters is that they are, quote, intrinsically disordered, contrary to natural law, grave depravity, and under no circumstances can they be approved or blessed. So now the church is going to bless what it says is intrinsically disordered and grave depravity by the decree of Pope Francis. The Catholic Church's last major statement on the issue said, God cannot bless sin. But now the Pope has declared that the Catholic Church apparently can bless sin. As believers, we are to love all people in all situations, pray for them. That includes everyone and everyone involved in such things. It's written, such for some of you. We're all in the same boat. But that's not what this is saying. This is not about praying for individuals or showing them God's love. This is about the Pope telling the Catholic Church it is now going to give its blessing on same-sex couples, a same-sex union. Now, from the start, I have nothing personally against the Pope. If he lived next door to me, I'm sure he'd be a nice neighbor, but this is not about a person. It's about what he did as someone who bears the title vicar or representative of Christ, Messiah, to the world. As far as the former statement of the Catholic Office of Doctrine that said God cannot bless sin, the Pope in effect fired that man who was in charge of that and replaced him with a friend who was willing to issue this new directive. The statement doesn't even specify couples who are celibate. So these are undoubtedly people who are presently engaging in what Catholic doctrine defines as sexual immorality and grave depravity. Now, if they who are sleeping together in such unions are to be blessed by the church, then certainly heterosexual couples who are sleeping together or in what the Bible says fornication must also be blessed by the church. And what then is to stop the church from having a blessing ceremony for couples in adultery? They can say, well, that's a sin against marriage, but so is this. Pope Francis and his leadership has said it's about inclusion and progressing. It's about being loving. No, it's not about inclusion or loving. We are to love and reach out with the love of God to everyone. But this is something else. What is it? I'll tell you what it is in one word. The word appears in the Bible. It's called apostasy. This is the Pope's great moment of apostasy. It's a watershed moment. It's a red flag moment, a milestone for Catholicism and even for Western civilization. Now, if you were watching closely, you could see it coming. This is the same Pope who warned Christians against sin, no, idolatry, no, evil, no. He warned Christians against, quote, rigidity of, ready, the 10 commandments against being too set on the Ten Commandments. So which of the Ten Commandments must we not become too set on? Having other gods, idols, coveting, adultery, murder? Which ones exactly should we become less strong about? The Pope went on to say that God gives us the freedom to search our own conscience for commandments. Really? So that thing that happened on Mount Sinai with Moses was a mistake. So Moses should have come down from the mountain and told the Israelites, I have these 10 commandments in stone, but don't get too set on them. Search your own conscience for your own commandments. And if your conscience says adultery is okay, go for it. Other gods, more power to you. Worshiping a golden calf as you're doing right now, God bless you. Or may the golden calf bless you. Pope Francis said that someone who holds strongly to such things as the 10 commandments has something wrong with them. Does that include Jesus? Because as far as I know, Jesus was pretty set on them. The Pope went on to say that the Ten Commandments are not a gift from God. Really? Well, then who gave them? Did they descend to Sinai from a spaceship? He goes on to say that while the Ten Commandments are not a gift from God, the Beatitudes are because, quote, they make you feel good. The Beatitudes are part of a sermon in which the Lord Messiah said, if you even look at a woman in lust, you're committing adultery. It's hyper Ten Commandments. I mean, a 10-year-old Sunday school student would know that. But the Pope apparently did not read that far into it. And he said this, 
I always try to understand what's behind people who are too young to have seen Moses walk down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and yet they still want to obey them. Did he actually say that? What is that? They shouldn't follow the Ten Commandments because the commandments came a while back. If you weren't there, it doesn't count. Forget about them. If you're not over 3,000 years old, don't worry about it. Now, it's not that the Ten Commandments save us. Messiah does. But is it okay to commit adultery now? Apparently, it's okay to commit grave depravity. And if you throw the Ten Commandments out, then you throw everything out because as far as I know, the Bible came out before most of us were born as did the Beatitudes. In fact, I believe Jesus came out before we were born. So we're not supposed to follow him? This is not an accident. Right after he issued the directive to bless same-sex unions, Pope Francis issued this directive. Listen, let us remain vigilant against sin, no, darkness, no, apostasy, no. Let us remain vigilant against rigid, there's that word again, ideological positions, meaning positions from the word of God. And he goes on, under the guise of good intentions. Guys, that means that, that those who uphold the word of God, well, it's that they don't really have good intentions. It's only a guise. They have evil intentions. This is also not an accident because though he speaks as if his directives are for mercy and inclusivity, he has spoken of those who hold to the Bible or who are conservative as evil. So it's not just don't hold firmly to the word of God but that those who do hold firmly or strongly to God's word are actually evil. He goes on, holding to such positions, meaning biblical positions, quote, separate us from reality and prevent us from moving forward. So according to the Pope, holding to the word of God separates us from reality and prevents us from moving forward. Moving forward into what? It has to be moving forward away from the positions of the word of God. If moving forward means moving forward off a cliff, then I don't want to be part of that forward moving movement because it's not really forward, it's downward. He goes on to say, we are called instead to set out and journey like the Magi following the light that always desires to lead us on at times along unexplored paths and new roads. So the Pope is saying that we are to now go on a quote new road which means a road that's new to thousands of years of the New Testament and Judeo-Christian faith. That means different. He says we have to go on a path that has been unexplored, meaning in the thousands of years of biblical faith, or in other words, unbiblical, an unbiblical road. And he frames it as taking up the journey of the Magi. Now, that sounds nice. What could be wrong with that? Well, for one thing, the Magi were pagan. Christians are not supposed to be pagan. The Pope is not supposed to be pagan. The Magi were pagan astrologers searching open to God in his revelation. It led them to Jesus. The Bible says, then God spoke to them in a dream, so then they received the word, then they needed to follow the word. If we've received God and the word, then we are not supposed to be open to following that which departs from the word and God, but to hold to it and not proceed toward paganism. What does the Bible say? The apostle says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, let nobody deceive you in any way, for it will not come the day of the Lord unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Before the Lord comes, there must first be a great apostasy. That's biblical prophecy. The word apostasy comes from the Greek apostosia, to fall away from one stand. Let me say that again, to fall away or depart from one stand. This is now the Catholic Church under the Pope falling away from its own stand, from the biblical stand on sexual morality. If someone is in a sin that the Bible says will exclude them from salvation, eternal life, and lead them to judgment, if you love them, you don't bless their sin. You don't sanctify their state of sin because that's leading them to judgment. You share with them the truth in love and do everything you can to bring them to God and his will. And no matter what this document from the Pope is saying, it's blessing the sin. It's communicating to the Catholic Church and lands that it's okay. If somebody is suffering from a fatal disease that's destroying them and you know the cure and you can tell them about it, but you don't, instead you bless their disease, their state of disease, you're not loving them, you're hating them. Because instead of bringing them life, you're consigning them to death. Any sin that would keep somebody from salvation and everlasting life is fatal. If I don't give them the medicine, but encourage them to stay in that state of dying, I'm not loving them, I am hating them. It'd be the same if the Pope were now to say, 
I'm going to bless couples in adultery. Forget about what man is saying. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God is very clear. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6, it says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, adulterers, thieves, the greedy, the habitually drunk, verbal abusers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And to put it into modern terms, it says, and those practicing same-sex sexuality. That is the word of God. Then it goes on to say, such were some of you, but you were cleansed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, and in the spirit of our God. But now that the Catholic Church is saying you have our blessing in that state, and actually in that union, well, those people are not going to be cleansed or saved. What you're doing is blessing them into hell. And the idea that the Pope really didn't change anything, it's, that's just semantics, that's sophistry. If you have to spend 5,000 words to try to argue that nothing has changed, you can be sure that everything has changed. It's like saying we're still against slavery, but now we're going to have a special ceremony to bless slave owners. They're going to come into the church with a slave in chains, and we're going to bless that union. And the culture is not going to be reading that document anyway. They're just going to be seeing same-sex couples being blessed in Catholic churches. The Pope has opened up the floodgates. And once you open up the floodgates, don't expect that you'll be able to close them. Expect a flood. Once you can bless what you yourself have called sin and disordered against natural law and grave depravity, you can and will bless anything. What will stop there from being ceremonies and blessings for those committing fornication? What about ceremonies and blessings for those living in polygamy? What about ceremonies for a father and daughter involved in incest and the church blesses their union? What about an abortion blessing ceremony? A woman comes in with child and her abortionist at her side and they both receive the blessing. Don't dismiss it. What the Pope just sanctioned was far more shocking a number of years back than these things are today. How did this all happen and what does it mean? Did an angel come down from heaven with a new revelation saying, hey guys, we had it all wrong. Sorry, God made a mistake. It's not really a grave depravity anymore. In fact, now you are to bless what you just called a grave sin. No, what happened was our civilization is descending headlong into apostasy and rebellion against God and his ways. And Pope Francis is following it just as the liberal mainline apostate Protestant churches have done so as well. But this is even bigger. See, years back, not even secular liberal atheists would have anything to do with blessing such things. But now the Pope, now Catholicism. When you see that happening, know the time is late. How does a Pope or a church go from agreeing with the Bible in this matter, that this is a grave sin, to now blessing it? The same way the American Democratic Party once firmly said that marriage is between a man and a woman. The same way that one of their leaders said, quote, marriage is between a man and a woman and states must respect that. Who said that? Joe Biden said that, who then signed the Respect for Marriage Act that said marriage is not between a man and a woman and all states must respect that. They all turned. They all said it was wrong, and then they all turned and said it was now good to be blessed, and now those who oppose it are to be stigmatized, marginalized, or punished. It's not even rational. How can you totally stand for something and then war against the very thing you totally stood for with no rational explanation for your metamorphosis? It's called apostasy. It's the turning, the turning way. It's as if a spell was cast on our culture. I spoke of this in the book, The Return of the Gods. The spirits that are now taking over our culture, even ancient spirits. And one of those spirits was specifically connected to the bending and twisting of sexuality and gender, the merging of male and female. When you turn away from God, you open the door to these things. Was Joe Biden visited by an angel? No. Was the Pope visited by an angel? No, or certainly not a good one. And this is how it happens. First they say, this is definitely wrong, sin. Well, then they say, well, it's wrong, but it's not so simple. Then we're wrestling with it. That's what Obama said. He said he was wrestling with same-sex marriage for years until the polls said it was now about 50-50 or the majority in favor. And then all of a sudden the wrestling match came to an end. And then the person reverses their original stand and announces 
that they are now for what they were against. They begin warring against the people who did not reverse themselves but stayed faithful. What the Pope just did is the papal version of don't ask, don't tell. What was that? In the 1990s, Bill Clinton opened up the military to same-sex sexuality and there was a massive public outcry against it. So he came up with don't ask, don't tell. It didn't change the policy, but it changed how it would be treated. Basically, it wouldn't be enforced, so it would be nullified. So Pope Francis said his priests shouldn't be asking such questions, just give the blessing of the church. It's the Latin translation of don't ask, don't tell. But it never stops there. Don't ask, don't tell didn't stop there. It was just the means to open the door to what many now call the queering of the American military, which exactly what happened, to where we now have even taxpayer dollars paying for the surgical transitioning of fighting men or women. And those who are not for this policy are now persecuted. They can be persecuted even in the military. That's what this is about. Imagine being persecuted for not being in favor of sexual immorality in and by the church. It happened to the Democratic Party, happened to much of older mainline Protestant churches. It's happened to the Boy Scouts. It's happened to the corporate world. It's happened to the school system. And now it's happening to the Pope and the Catholic Church. It's one thing when the Democratic Party goes this way or the Boy Scouts or Hollywood. But it's a whole nother animal, a much bigger one, and a prophetic sign when Rome and the Vatican and the Catholic Church go that way. And it will have massive ramifications. You see, the Catholic Church and Western civilization are intrinsically joined. If the Roman Catholic Church should blatantly war against the Word of God, then all Western civilization and much of world civilization will be affected. Then all the restraints will be removed for the unbeliever as well as the nominal believer. One of the key markers of the Christianization of Western civilization in the Roman Empire was the change that the gospel brought about in the realm of sexuality, sexual morality. Sexual immorality was part of paganism. Same-sex relations was part of paganism. Gender confusion was part of paganism. The gospel changed that. What we are now witnessing is the reversal of what happened. We're witnessing the return to paganism and to these ancient spirits. And now the change is being wrought by the church. And since the Roman-based church, or what became the Catholic Church, had a major role in solidifying these moral changes away from paganism, for this to happen now in the Catholic Church is a major sign toward a post-Christian, pagan, apostate, end-time civilization. That's why this whole issue is so dangerous for the Christian faith, because it will attempt to end Christianity or true Christianity. For the true believer, for the true follower of God, it means something else. It will mean persecution. Mark my words, what happened at the end of 2023 with the Pope's new policy is not going to stop there. It was just the beginning. And it won't stop with unions. There will be marriages and full-out celebrations of what Catholic doctrine says is disordered and a grave depravity. And those who resist the celebrating of this will be pressured to go along with it or punished or castigated, maybe even excommunicated. It sounds like a science fiction where everybody gets taken over or a horror movie or something else. Well, it sounds like biblical prophecy. See, the times of which the Bible foretells, it's now. It says, when men shall be lovers of self without natural affection, haters of the good, teaching perverse doctrines, that's the end times. The Bible says in the end times, the Jewish people will return to their homeland. Israel will be back in the world and the entire world will focus on Israel and its controversy. Israel will be fighting for its existence. That's what the Bible says. We're here. It was for this reason that in the newest book I wrote, the Josiah Manifesto, the subtitle was the guide for the end times because we're there and we need to be prepared for what's coming. In the last few weeks, I was about to start writing the next book, which was going to be the sequel to The Return of the Gods. And I will write that book. But I was led that right now I had to write a different book, which more than any other that I've written is about the end times. Because we're here and it's accelerating, going faster than ever before. Pray for me as I do this. The Bible says that in the last days, it will be a time when people will worship that which is not God. In the end, even to worship one called the Antichrist or the Beast. Notice what Paul said, the apostasy, the falling away will come first. Then he says the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist will be revealed. It says all the earth will worship this one. 
And it speaks about one called the false prophet who will lead the world to worship the Antichrist. Many see in this an end time false apostate church. Many have seen in this a union of apostate churches even centered in Rome. The Bible speaks of a beast with seven heads that represents seven hills. The city famous for having seven hills, most famous is Rome. Now I'm not singling out one church. It was the older mainline Protestant denominations that led the way in this. Rather, it's as if all apostate churches will join together, but with Rome as its likely center. And what just happened, if anything, has pointed in that direction of a global apostate coming Christianity. Not just one denomination, but a union of many. Note, just a day or two before the Pope implemented the new policy, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, implemented the same policy. And just a few days after he did it, in the land of the Pope, Italy, a Catholic Church featured a nativity scene with two Marys, as if two lesbians. Surprised? It is written that the end times will be marked by blasphemy. And now it's the church that's committing it. These things are to happen before the end, before Messiah comes. But when he comes, you want to be on the right side with him. Those into these things will say, well, you're not on the right side of history. Well, listen, I don't want to be on the right side of history if history is disordered and fallen and apostate. I want to be on the right side of God. And that leads to this. Many of you who listen to me, who follow my teachings, are from a Catholic background. Listen, in the same way it's not love to not speak the truth in love when needed, I need to speak the truth here. I may step on some toes, but I have to, or it's not love. This should tell you, what just happened should tell you something very loud and clear. It is the nature of man to go by tradition and for churches and sects and religions to elevate their traditions to the word of God or versus the word of God. Once you elevate the traditions of man, you're on dangerous ground because then man takes the authority of God. And where does that lead? It leads to this. This is your sign. God says in the Bible, you make void the word of God. He speaks to those who are doing it. By your traditions, the traditions of men. Tradition is sand. It can shift with the wind, as you can see. But the word of God is not sand. It's a rock. It's the rock. It's the only rock. It's this rock that you can stand on, the only one, and be saved. The words and traditions and doctrines of men will pass away. As it's written, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. No pope can get you to heaven. No church can. There's only one who can, and his name is Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, your Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer. No Pope, no religious leader died to save you. No church or church tradition died to save you. Only one died to save you, Jesus. There will be no Catholic section in heaven, nor a Protestant section or any other. Only one section, a saved section. The Pope will have to answer before God for what he did and what he's gonna do. And you will stand before God, we all will, and he won't ask you what your religion was. He'll ask you what your heart was. And on that day, you won't be able to say, well, this is what my church told me. You were accountable, not anybody else. God gave you his word, the Bible. Forget man, go by the word of God. The Bible says, let all men be liars, let God be true. Get a Bible if you don't have it. Go with that period. God will speak to you directly through the word of God. If the doctrines and traditions of men contradict the word of God, then let them go. Follow the word of God. It is the rock. He himself will lead you. Jesus said, come to me and I'll give you life. He said, you must be born again or you cannot enter heaven. It's not religion. It's your heart. It's God. You and God, a relationship. You and him. It says, as many as received him, not a church, not a tradition, as many as received him, for real, each personally in their heart, they became the children of God. And they were not judged, but were saved for eternal life, heaven. My Catholic friends, priests and bishops who follow these messages, this is for you a red flag. What just happened? This is the time you have to draw the line. You have to say no and resist and defy that which goes against the ways of God. 
You have to stand solidly on the Word of God and for the ways of God and let the chips fall where they may. And this goes for anyone in any church, Catholic or Protestant, Orthodox or any other that has fallen into apostasy. Anything that goes against the clear Word of God, you have to put away. If you don't, and you don't do it now, you'll be swept away. One compromise at a time leads to destruction. Ministers, leaders, pastors, if you don't do this now, you're going to be leading those under your charge to destruction, and their blood will be upon your head. To lead anyone astray is a grievous sin with severe consequences with God. You have to say no. If that means you have to separate yourself from any establishment, any organization, any system, any falsehood, then that's what you have to do. You've got one life and one chance. No man or leader or institution is gonna be responsible for your salvation. You are. When you stand before God on the day of judgment, the Pope won't be there to defend you. He'll be standing before God's judgment as well. The works of man, the institutions of man, the precepts of man will pass away, but God and his word will remain forever. And just as there are no denominations in heaven, so on earth in the last days, it won't be about one denomination or another, but about being a true follower of Jesus, the Messiah. And it will be about a false and apostate church on the other side and the faithful and true and real followers on this side. This is the hour, this is the moment when you have to make your stand before God once and for all. And for you who have been involved in same-sex relations, alternate sexuality, it is love to tell you too that these things will rob you, harm you, destroy you, keep you from salvation, lead you to judgment. But God loves you. That's why he speaks the truth. He gave his life for you just as much as for anybody. And his arms are open to you to come out of the darkness and into the light. We're all in the same boat. And for those of you who are watching these events and confused, don't be. God said it would happen. All the more you want to make sure you're right with him. And the only way is to receive for real Jesus, to be born again for real, to follow him for real as his disciple. It can happen with a simple prayer. You can pray right after this video. He'll keep you, he will guide you, he'll protect you. And to the Pope, Pope Francis, you believe you are the vicar of Jesus, the one who's been left with the charge of Messiah. But Jesus speaks of those left in charge. He gave a parable of a man who left his house in the charge of a servant. And while he was away, that servant went away from the word of the master and led the house against the ways of the master. When the master returned, he judged that servant who had done that. God is real and his word is eternal. If you dilute his word, change his word, bend, transform his word, dismiss his word, or against it, you do so at your own peril. The blood of the millions and millions you help lead away from God and away from his word and away from salvation will be upon you. You will soon be in eternity and standing before the judgment seat of God, as with everyone else. And all the trappings of your office will be gone. It's written, it's appointed for man to die and then judgment. It is written that God wills that all would repent. That includes popes. The time you have to turn back is now. For the rest of you watching, many of you have prayed, I wish I could live in Bible times. Congratulations. Welcome to the end times. Perilous times, but the most exciting of times to rise up in the Lord. It's time to be great. It's time to have nothing more to do with that which wars against God. It's time to go all out for God. Lastly, if you don't want to miss the prophetic messages that are going to come from this channel, hit subscribe now to get the books, the free gifts, and more. Stay tuned for what's coming up. And until next time, this is Jonathan Kahn saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Shalom.